Thank you. Well, as Ed mentioned, I used to be a neuroscientist. When I was training doing this, I lost respect for my own neurobiology. And what do I mean by that? When I was training, I, spent, I slept only every second night and I spent all of my waking hours in a completely dark room. I was researching neuroplasticity, how the brain wires up during development and how these connections change over time with light and dark. Now, I'm sure you can all appreciate the impact of lack of sleep on your health and well-being and brain. I was tired. I felt flat. I felt like I'd lost my curiosity and my zest for life. And I felt quite out of control emotionally. I also made mistakes. One day, I was so tired, I dropped and smashed a full glass bottle of concentrated hydrochloric acid all over the floor of the lab. Now, this burns your skin instantly if it gets on you, and the fumes that are released are toxic. So this sleepy little mishap resulted in evacuation of the entire lab, and I had to call the hazardous chemicals response unit. Well, <clears throat> I no longer look down the lens of the microscope at the brain anymore. Instead, I consider neuroscience through the lens of everyday life. But it turns out, since I hung up my lab coat, I've carried on running a few experiments of my own on my own brain at home. Now, this particular technique that I've been working on has the power to improve your memory. It can help make you more creative. It'll help change the way you respond emotionally to the world around you. Now, I'm well aware that my research is anecdotal because I'm only N equals one, so I'm gonna share with you some science that backs up this particular technique I use. So what is this technique? Simply involves taking an afternoon nap. Now, before I go on, I'd like to ask, how many of you here ever fight off that urge to nap in the early afternoon? And is there anyone here who's willing to admit they've ever taken a nap at work? <laughs> Do you know the most common place to nap when you're in the workplace? Anyone know? It's the back seat of the car. Now, back when I was training as a neuroscientist, I'd sometimes do this. I'd take off and have a, have a sneaky power nap in the back seat of the car. But here in Australia, in the summer months, it gets a little more tricky, especially when you're hiding from your boss under a couple of sandy old beach towels. Yeah, you're not looking at the healthiest outcome. So this makes me wonder, why do so many of us feel we have to hide this urge to nap that we feel in the afternoon? Or if we nap at the weekend, why is it like, talked about like it's a guilty indulgence? In our hyper-connected, fast-paced, multitasking world, rest, well, may, maybe not demonised, it's certainly underappreciated. It's not celebrated. Napping, that's for the lazy, or it's a luxury. I worry that taking time out from all that busy and turning and focusing and just taking a break is something that we seem to have lost the ability to enjoy doing. So a series of papers were published in the journal Science last year that looked at this very issue. The researchers were curious, well, what happens if people take 15 minutes out of their day and just sit quietly? So they invited a series of volunteers into the lab and they put them alone in a bare room with nothing for 15 minutes. They had no pens or paper or iPhones, a clock, nothing to entertain themselves except their own thoughts. Then afterwards they asked what they thought of it. Over 50% of the people that took part rated that experience as not enjoyable. And one person's data even had to be thrown away because when the experiment left a pen behind, they sat and wrote a to-do list. <laughs> so the researchers thought, well, if just sitting by yourself doing nothing's not enjoyable, how about we give them the option of doing something painful and unpleasant instead? So they wired everyone up to an electric shock machine. They gave them a button, they could self-administer painful electric shocks, they put them back in the room and waited to see what would happen. Over two-thirds of the people that took part chose to self-administer painful electric shocks instead of sitting quietly with their own thoughts. One of the men, who was clearly an outlier in the data set, he chose to shock himself 190 times. <laughs> well, does, does this tell 
us that we really have lost the ability to just take a break. The researchers believe it's because our mammalian brains have evolved to be continually monitoring the horizon for threats and opportunities. And so taking time just to turn inward and turn our attention off, off what's out there is something that's become quite unnatural. And perhaps this is why so many people are turning to practices such as meditation as a way of calming in their mind. While mindfulness and meditation have some wonderful benefits for our health and well-being in our brains. But meditation takes practice and determination and effort. Afternoon naps, not so much. So what is it about this urge to nap that we feel in the early afternoon? Well, our, our sleep and our wake cycles are entrained or regulated by our internal biological clocks, our circadian rhythms. And these are controlled by the rotation of the Earth, the rising and the setting of the sun. And lots of our physiology ebbs and flows to light and dark, our heart rate, our blood pressure, our body temperature, our surges of hormones, our immune response, our brain waves. They ebb and flow to light and dark. Now, that urge to nap that many of you may feel in the early afternoon is programmed into your biological clock. Now, many of you may never feel sleepy until the evening, and that's normal for you. But for those of you who do fight off that urge to nap, it is simply a natural reflection of your neurobiology. Now, of course, there's many cultures in the world that recognise this, this neurobiological urge, and they've incorporated the siesta into their part of their daily routines. And some of the technology companies in the world, Silicon Valleys, and even some universities here in Australia, have installed napping pods that allow the staff and their students to take a nap when the urge strikes because they understand it is simply a normal biological need and they understand the benefits that come from that. Now, Winston Churchill, he was also very devoted to his afternoon nap and he wrote in his memoir, Nature did not intend mankind to work from eight in the morning until midnight without the refreshment that comes from blessed oblivion, which even if for 20 minutes is sufficient to renew all the vital forces. 20 minutes of blessed oblivion to renew your vital forces. Well, it turns out Winston Churchill was onto something in that he had figured out the optimal length of the afternoon nap, which at about 20 to 25 minutes has also been supported by data from NASA and their pilots and astronauts. What this means, if you nap for 20 minutes, you don't fall into that, that slow wave, deep sleep that when you're awoken from, perhaps your boss is knocking on the window of the car or you've set your alarm. When you wake from that deep sleep, you feel cranky and groggy. You can't get going. That's what sleep scientists call sleep inertia. Now, if you sleep for 20 minutes, you don't get sleep inertia and you get the benefits. So what are the benefits? Well, the first one I want to tell you about comes from work from a sleep science group at Harvard in the US. And in this experiment, they invited a series of people into the lab. In the late morning, they taught the people how to navigate their way through a virtual 3D maze. Then they split the group into two, half were tucked up for a siesta, and half were just left to sit quietly with their own thoughts. No electric shock machines to entertain these lot. When everyone was retested later in the day, the people who had napped had a better spatial memory of the maze. They found their way through quicker, they made less mistakes. What is key here is that the enhanced memory occurred when the nap took place after the learning process. It's almost as if napping hit save on some newly downloaded document in their brains. Well, most of us aren't uh, trying to navigate our way through a virtual 3D maze at work. We're busy trying to solve complex problems. Well, one way to solve a complex problem is to focus all of your energy and mental resources on it and work away at it until you've done it. Another way, perhaps, is to use insight. Now, by insight, I mean those aha moments, those eureka moments, those moments when it seems like a light bulb suddenly turned on in your brain and you can see the, pr uh, the, the solution to a problem that previously had you stumped. Our human brains are designed to achieve creative insights when they're calm and when they're happy and when they're relaxed, not when they're attentively focused on solving the problem. So you can see where I'm going with this, can't you? People who take afternoon naps are much more likely to solve problems using creative insight. 
Now, there's some wonderful stories about the great creative thinkers and geniuses of the past who, who use napping as a brain hack to ach help achieve a creative insight. And one of these belongs to Thomas Edison and his invention of the light bulb. But that light bulb has a lot to answer for, for the current state of our circadian rhythms in modern day life. So I'm going to tell you the story instead about Salvador Dali. Now, when he went to sleep for his afternoon naps, he'd hold ball bearings or keys in his hand and he'd relax in his chair and as he fell asleep, they'd drop on the floor, the sound would wake him up and he'd immediately write notes and draw images of what he'd seen in his brain. He said in those moments he walked on the taut and invisible wire that separates sleep from wake. So how about that? A nap can help you achieve creative insight and it can help improve your memory. Now, the last piece of research I want to share with you perhaps has the most direct impact on my everyday life. This work comes from another sleep science group, this time of Berkeley in the US, and they're interested in how sleep and napping change the way we respond emotionally to the world around us. Again, groups of volunteers were invited into the lab and they were shown a series of photos with people pulling, pulling different facial expressions. Now, in this experiment, the people were either happy, sad, angry or fearful. Everyone had to rate how the intensity of that person's emotion based on their facial expression and how it made them feel. Everyone did this in the morning and in the evening. Half the group was sent off for a nap and half were left to stay awake. Now, the people who stayed awake all day, when they, were, they, they did this in the late evening, their emotional response to the negative emotions, to the anger and the fear, had been dialed right up. They were much more in tune to them. In contrast, the people who'd taken a nap, their emotional response was quite different. It had been dialed right down to the anger and fear, and they were much more in tune to the happy face. Now, the researchers believe that napping is a way of calming and resetting our emotional brain. It helps smooth those rough, jagged emotional edges that build up during the day. And they believe napping gives our prefrontal cortex, that's the part of the brain here that it's like our brain's CEO and it makes top-down decision-making processes. A nap gives our prefrontal cortex greater control over our emotional brain, in particular how we respond to moods and feelings in others. As a mother, this translates directly into how I have learned to respond to the shifting moods and changing emotions of my two little boys, Harry and Jamie. An afternoon nap just doesn't make me feel less sleepy. It helps me be more kind. I'm more patient. I'm more compassionate as a mother. Choosing to indulge your neurobiology, taking a 20-minute power nap, that blessed oblivion, can help improve your learning, your memory, can improve your performance at work. It can help you achieve some creative insight, and that could turn into an idea worth spreading. It'll help make you kinder and more compassionate. Now, you don't need to research neuroscience to know how to nap. You don't need to do a course or follow a guru or download an app. All you need to do is to understand and then choose to indulge your neurobiology. Take a 20-minute power nap. It might not just change the course of your afternoon. It could change the course of your life. Thank you.